Uh, all right, I'll do, a, I'll do an abbreviated version of this because you're going to tell us about your, your history here, I take it. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're going to hear uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Starcast Technology and Robotic Corporation and his role contributes to company strategy, creates and drives operational vision, and streamlines operations across business functions. Uh, but he's a CMU guy at heart. He was here for many years and he's going to tell us uh, about some of that journey from an RI. Uh, to a company that got acquired. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Amazing. Well, let's welcome. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Well, you. hopefully, I have to... <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I, you know, walk you through uh, 20 years of RE Square uh, and that, that started at, at CMU uh, and, you know, share a, a lot of the, the successes, but also a lot of the blunders and a lot of the decision points. Hopefully, have some lessons learned. Uh, I'm clearly not the typical journey. I don't know if I'm a blueprint. You probably don't want to follow the journey, but there might be some good nuggets in there that you could leverage, you know, as, as uh, you know, you know, as you move through the world. Um, all right, let's see. All right, so 28 years ago, and that, can I get rid of this uh, bond? Okay. All right, there we go. All right, 28 years ago. So I, uh, I came to CMU in 1990, and then uh, 95, I graduated in electrical computer engineering. Yes, that's a longer story. There's an extra year in there. You probably figured that out. Um, you know, had to find my way. But uh, 1995, I graduated and decided to take half the money to stay at Berg and for Carnegie Mellon. You know, I had this great opportunity out on the west coast but i i felt like i hadn't finished my education and i hadn't finished you know uh learning about robo robots so i stayed in town um and i first started at the field robotics center with uh red who thank you for being here uh and uh, got learned some work ethic from certain areas uh but in 1996 it was 95 96 there was this new thing that was schooling up called the natural robotics engineering center at the time it was actually called the natural robotics engineering consortium with the mindset and in fact i think it started off nasa engineering consortium where it's going to spin out companies right so uh so i i joined uh i won't divert with too many stories but one of the one of my favorites is they were i was down on the front lawn caterpillar was one of the first investors in uh the uh the consortium and we were working on this autonomous excavator it was a cat 325d uh i was young stupid it was 2 a.m not the best neighborhood at that time uh there were trailers out on the front lawn and uh you know i was coding works just dating myself you know uh at that time and you know it's 2 a.m i'm by myself and this car comes and it does not look very safe uh so what do, what do you do about working in robotics is well you learn how to operate this stuff so i jumped into the cat 325 excavator uh grabbed eight thousand pounds of dirt spun it around and hurled it towards the car and uh you know i felt safer and, and empowered from that point on uh so that that was uh the beginning uh you know and the, the whole reason i went to the, the to the end rep is i wanted to get robots out into the world right i did enjoy the theory the r d but i really wanted to see robotics be you know be synonymous with ubiquitous right um and so i i was there i worked on a lot of different uh programs uh, along the way, I got, uh, I was the first master's of robotics. Well, why is that? Because I started taking some PhD courses, realized I may not be the smartest guy in the room uh, or have the wherewithal. So I uh, convinced the dean at the time, hey, we should have a master's of robotics. <laughs> look at all these courses I took and look at this work I'm, I'm doing over here. This would be a great piece. Uh, and, uh, you know, he said, well, yeah, that's a good idea. And actually, so then a whole bunch of folks at the NREC uh, followed suit and that started the MSR program uh, back, uh, you know, I think in 99 is probably when it officially launched. Um, so that was the beginning. Then I was getting frustrated because it was five years in, I was working on Caterpillar. I'm like, this is going to be out as an autonomous product, you know, in, in a couple of years and it didn't happen. So I'm like, okay, well, let me join a company that already has some robots out there, right? Some floor cleaning robots. 
uh, join the company and, and learn exactly how to not run a business. It went to three different CEOs. I remember at a, an apartment in Highland Park, uh, I remember having an emergency meeting in my apartment while the third CEO was being established. Uh, so uh, a lot of lessons there as well. I was getting frustrated uh, and I didn't really know what to do. So this was 22 years ago. Okay, well, I'll start reading some books. I'll start educating myself how to start up a business. You know, that's what you uh, learn, right? Yeah, this one. Uh, so we became an S corporation. Why an S corporation? Because as an engineer who thought he knew everything, oh, that looks right. But I didn't really understand why. So this is uh, learning as we, we're building the ship as we go. Um, so on July 20th, 2001, RE Squared Robotics was founded. Um, here, let me minimize this and so you can see some there. There we go. Um, and I just, uh, so what I did is I went and opened up a bank account. I put $1,000, that's about all I could afford, and put $1,000 in the bank to start this business um, and became the first shareholder of Robotics Engineering Excellence or RE Squared. Um, and the goal was simply provide robotics engineering services to the NREC while I figured out what I was going to do next. I would love to say I had this great vision and plan for what RE squared was going to be, but I didn't. I was just trying to, it was a stopgap to figure out, okay, where, where am I going to go after this? By the way, it was always just RE squared or RE2, but then eventually people said, well, what do you do? I'm like, well, we're robotics engineering excellence, but you know, that's a mouthful which would have also been a bad name. So both of my names I selected were horrible. Uh, so we're like, but eventually we became known like a BASF or something like that. You don't know what it means. You just know the BASF, right? Or 3M. So we, we were RE squared and we said, let's add the robotics at the end so people know we're a robotics company. But if anyone who knows what the RE squared means, it's like an ATM machine or a, a <laughs> pin number, right? So, uh, you know, that, that was the beginning. Um, so that there was really no vision and no purpose. It was just, okay, let's, uh, let's buy the time. Then along came this, uh, a DARPA program called Perceptor, Perception for Off-Road uh, Mobility. Dr. Scott Fish was the, the, you know, the PM for it. Uh, Tony Stentz was my advisor in grad school. Uh, he was, uh, the lead on the CMU, the CMU team. There's four teams. We were going up against General Dynamics and some, some big companies, and uh, it was competitive, and it was down-select. Uh, and they were working with another local uh, organization. It wasn't, wasn't delivering the mail on the unmanned ground vehicles. So Tony came to me, hey, Jurgen, we need this thing to work. we got to win this program. Uh, and I said, okay, well, what do you need it? Well, I needed like three, four months. Oh, gosh. So what I do is I round up any you know warm body I could that knew anything about robotics and we started working on this thing you know my, one of them was Mark D. Lewis I, you know he still regrets the day when he walked by and I said do you know anything about carburetors uh but that that kind of set the team right there it, it created this uh awesome team that rallied around we got a challenge we got to make this thing drive by itself because we got a test coming up so this was all before DARPA Grand Challenge, before Urban Challenge. Red will tell you all those stories. But uh, this was the precursor to that. And uh, it was a down so like at the end of the three years, the CMU team was on top, right? We won this thing, right? It wasn't easy. It was rocky in the beginning, but we had a unique solution where we had an eye in the sky with a helicopter, a ground vehicle, and it performed really well. Um, and was very successful, which led to follow-on programs to include the, the Grand Challenge. So great success. Um, what was the effect of that? I instantly got employees. I wasn't planning on that. I got employees and just as importantly, got a, got a, uh, a track record in, the, in a really hard market to get a track record in, which is the Department of Defense. Really important. You know, because that that we we saved the day on that, you know, on that first effort, you know, three months in. And the next thing you know, we had a three hundred thousand dollar contract from DARPA to make a new vehicle. That was a big deal when you're like three people. Right. So, um, it, it, you know, it kind of gave us some momentum and confidence. Then for the next uh, five years, we worked on a lot of really cool stuff. 
We worked on uh, uh, autonomous uh, mining with Joy uh, Mining Company. We worked on aerial vehicles. That's the perceptor vehicle. We did sensing. We worked on uh, unmanned ATVs, uh, throwable robots uh, with the Marine Corps. We grew to a million dollars in revenue, right? And we we're still profitable, but got distracted. I'm like, we're having fun. We're you know, but I'm back into the solving really hard problems. Oh, wait, I want to get this out into the market. So, uh, you know, what do you do? Um, so here we are in 2006. Here's a snapshot of where we are. Had about nine employees, to include my wife, Jess, um, who uh, was then the COO. So she, so I, by the way, I met her on July 20th, exactly one year after found, founding the company. So it, uh, coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but what I will acknowledge is that was one of the smartest things because she had been out in business and she was the vice president of marketing for a software company. And I'm the guy saying, hey, if we build this really cool thing, everyone's going to just show up and want it and buy it. And she's saying, no, you idiot. You have to have a strategy and a plan. You have to go to trade shows. You have to market this thing. And guess what? She was right. So um, good lesson learned there. Make sure you, you marry up like I did. Um, we were primarily an unmanned ground vehicle uh, company at this point. But isn't this funny, Simon? At that point, I didn't see unmanned ground vehicles like or the driverless car industry coming to fruition anytime soon, probably not, not even for the next 10 years. This was back in 2006. And here, here we are today, right? Um, now, but we wanted to get a, a robotic product in the world. We wanted to make a positive impact on the world, um, but didn't really know what it, we wanted it to be. Um, we had essentially one customer, Carnegie Mellon University, right? We, we were working for the university, essentially. Um, so the question is, what would you do, right? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you what I, you know, I can make this be two hours long if we get interactive, but I'm just going to cut to the chase. So I went out and pursued America's Seed Fund, so the SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research Program. Um, we got a, an SBIR. Uh, this was during the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. There's a lot of IEDs, roadside bombs, et cetera, a lot of dangerous stuff. And we wanted to make a positive impact, save lives take the person, remove them from the, uh, you know, um, the, the harmful situation, remote them. So we, but we saw what was being put out there. We're like, we can do, make, do better than that. So let's make these modular mobile robotic arms. So that's what we did. And we got a, an SBIR grant and we, we, we crushed it, got a, you know, phase one, we got a phase two, then we want another one, got a phase one and a phase two. Now we got all this non-dilutive investment coming into the business, and we're doing like one and a half million dollars in revenue pretty, you know, pretty soon. And we're we're hiring additional staff and we're creating core IP. So the momentum is starting to pick up. So why did we do that? Well, we knew we wanted to do more than just contract engineering. Um, we did not have a concrete plan that any VC would say, yeah, I'm gonna give you money, right? Uh, we learned a lot about defense from working at the NRAC, right? So we knew the customer and what they wanted to hear, how to con tell the story to convince them to give us money. Um, and we knew, uh, you know, I went and I took seminars at Pitt. They had a program that taught you how to write SBIRs. I, uh, I, I went out and learned because it's an art to win these things, right? You know, it's usually a 10% hit rate. Um, and we got up to a 36% hit rate on phase ones and a 90% hit rate on phase twos, right? We learned the, the recipe. Um, but what was important about the SBIR program is it gives you two things, a problem that a customer wants to solve, like, hey, I, this is something I need and here's some funding. And oh, by the way, it, yeah, we'll have government purpose rights, but you're pretty protected for a long time. You, we get to keep the IP, right? We, we get to have the patents. It's, it's, it's really powerful. Um, but what was really important at this time is we gained focus. Aha, we finally know what we're going to do. We're going to make, we're going to be a mobile manipulation company. And that's what we're meant to do. Um, and oh, by the way, what's, what's driving us? We want to save lives. 
We want to make a positive impact on the world. So that was our DNA. Now we knew where to go uh, with, with our, our future. That focus created growth. Once we, we knew, instead of just dabbling here and there, we're like, this is what we're doing. We started growing. We grew 764% um, in, those, in those years. And we continue to remain profitable. So we no one, but you know, I put that thousand dollars in and we bootstrapped this business up until 2013 just by winning contracts, getting non-dilutive investment. Um, and along the way, we gained a lot of IP and a lot of experience, you know, a lot of you know, we didn't do so much on patents, it's more know-how. Uh, and and just investing in our people and pushing an envelope. But it was all focused around building from the ground up, going to the field robotics mindset. This thing has to work outside. You got to deal with sun. You got to deal with rain. You got to deal with shock, vibration, temperature. Uh, you know, you have to deal with all the elements uh, and be able to operate in that environment. So we designed from the ground up systems that did that. Um, which is different than most industrial automation companies like ABB, KUKA, FANUC. All you know, they they had a different set of requirements. Move something from A to B as fast as you can, as reliably as you can. Which means size, weight, and power don't matter, and weather sealing doesn't matter because you're inside. So we differentiated ourselves from the the core market related to manipulation. Then along the way, 2010, da 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 finally started shipping product. We shipped 181 units to the Air Force for uh, explosive ordnance disposal. Once again, to keep someone away from a threat and keep them safe. Um, so it was really exciting. And since then we've sell, sold over 650 robotic arms to the military since then. But what was the effect of this? Oh, this is more profitable product can be more profitable. You know, you can have much higher gross margins than you can contract engineering services. So that, which will allow you to do two things. It helps you create a healthier company, um, but it also allows you to make some decision-making and start investing in yourselves and figuring out how to maneuver in the market. Okay, so we are crushing it, right? January 23, uh, 2013, uh, we had over 50 employees. We're coming off our best revenue. We are up over $8 million in revenue at this point. Diversified portfolio within the defense sector. Okay, two months later, March, March 2013. You're the CEO of this company. Boom. Congress issues a budget sequestration. You're like, oh, okay. That shouldn't be a big deal. No, big deal. Money stops flowing. Um, and I am, for the first time, 13 years into this force, I... I waited until the last minute because the value of this company is the people, right? Uh, I had to lay off a handful of people. Uh, my lawyer said, well, you got to you know, send them out the door. Don't let them come back in. They're going to mess. Nope. I ignored my lawyers. Once again, I thought I knew best, right? I ignored them and I said, okay, I brought the people in the room and I treated them like adults. And I said, look, this is beyond my control. Um, you are all amazing talent. I want you here, but we can't afford this. Um, so for the next two weeks, you're going to have be able to come in the office, continue to work on whatever you're going to work on. You're going to work with my director of HR. She's going to find you a job, right? And you're going to get a severance on the, on the backside of this. Um, by the end of those two weeks, all but one person had another job, right? And that's an important thing because fast forward several years later, Several of them came back because we treated them with respect and dignity, and that's you know that that's a key theme you're going to see through uh, today. Um, so we had uh, you know in March of 2013, so we laid off some of our staff, but you're seeing attrition of companies. Companies are shutting down because money the the faucet's been cut off. Um, but we were in the process of pursuing three large acquisition programs. So DOD acquisition programs, it's a, it's a, hey, we're gonna buy thousands of this robot, right? And we were lining ourselves up strategically to go win a half a billion dollars of it, right? Um, and we thought we had a high probability of winning at least one of them. So that was where we are. Um, you know, it's kind of bleak, but there's like this 
carrot out there, right? So what did we end up doing? Okay, the only way we're gonna weather this storm is I'm gonna go raise some money. So now, after bootstrapping for 13 years, went out and raised the Series A. But I had to survive while doing the Series A. Oh, by the way, in October of that year, they issued a government shutdown with also further slowed the, the flow of money to DOD contractors. Um, so what, I, what did I do? I went out and got some bridge funding. I went out and got convertible debt from Innovation Works and from Startbot. Um, I got a, I went to Harrisburg and um, you know hypnotized them somehow, and they were kind enough to believe in me uh, and uh, give uh, give us four hundred thousand to execute on our plan. I went out and got a loan, right? Uh, I leveraged my line of credit, uh, and you know um, probably not in a way you're supposed to. You're supposed to be there just uh, you know you know, help with the backlog, uh, you know, it, timing issues, but I was really leveraging it to get us through this storm. And why was I doing all this? Because it was all about the people. The strength of a company is its people. Uh, I had to keep that team together because that's where the brilliance was. That's where the IP was. I had to keep it together. But, uh, you know, we did finalize a Series A uh, round with Draper Triangle Ventures and Riverfront in 2014. Um, and why did we do that? We wanted to increase our probability of winning that half billion dollars, right? And then with a VC, oh, and we are going to start investigating commercial markets, right? So we're going to go win that program up to, and let me tell you why, and we're going to go commercialize. So why did we do that? Well, we said, let's, let's, let's think about this strategically. There's been a lot of attrition in the market. The competition just got smaller. So our probability win just went up. And in fact, we were uh, at the time of the Series A, we were on five out of the five teams bidding on uh, a big, pro uh, one, you know, the, one of the big programs. Um, now, at the time of proposal submission, one of the teams kicked us off and we're down to four out of five. That's the 100% and the 80%. And we knew we needed to be, start thinking beyond defense too. So that's, that was the whole reason why we, we took the series in. Uh, so, uh, you know, thinking beyond defense, we reached out to Dr. Rory Cooper at the Human uh, Engineering Research Lab. He had this strong arm technology, mobile manipulation. Hey, move a patient from, or a person from a wheelchair to a bed, wheelchair to a toilet. It's saving lives, improving quality of life. It's right in our bailiwick. Let's start uh, investigating that. So we licensed that technology from the University of Pittsburgh. I did forget to mention that when I started the business, I licensed out that, um, uh, you know, a lot of my um, uh, research from the NREC and licensed that technology when I started RE Squared as well. Um, so now we're licensing from the University of Pittsburgh and we're saying, okay, we're gonna commercialize this as well. Okay, we get to 2017. Where are we? Okay, me, the majority of the comp company was still focused on defense. We got to win that big program, right? You know, I, I convinced Harrisburg that's what we're going to do. I convinced VCs we're going to do. Uh, that's the near term win. Um, we, there's not much traction with commercial yet, um, like zero. <laughs> right. Um, but we're, we're still doing analysis on the wheelchair uh, market. Okay, we lost that program. You know, the one that, that 100%, percent, you know, and then it fell to 80%. Yeah, the one team that kicked us off, they won, right? Um, ouch, that's a, that's a gut punch, right? Um, then it's like, in order to truly compete for those other two programs, we need more money because we put most of our money in that one that was such a high probability. Um, and we had pretty good probability of win for the, uh, you know, for both of them. Um, so what did we do? We said, you know what, let's go raise some more money. So I did a series A extension, another 1.5 million. Went back to Draper and Riverfront. They still believed in me. They still believed in the company, what we were doing. Uh, it only took two months and another $1.5 million was put in our bank account. All right, go do it. Um, yeah. So you got from the 2014 to the 2017 that that first investment got you 
was it revenue or were you, was the burn rate low enough that you could basically live for those three years on that first? Oh, no, we had to keep pulling, you know, the size of the company, we had to keep pulling okay. uh, contract revenue in two. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And we saw some, we had contract revenue, product revenue, and then to keep the people that I needed executing on the plan, we had the investment, which paid for them. Got it. Right. Nice. So the, the investment was really in people. Um, so we invested most of the cash um, into building, uh, you know, the robotic arms for the, those remaining two programs. We hired consultants to continue to flesh out that, you know, uh, wheelchair arm. But we 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 did reserve enough cash to set to really go hire a business development person in in commercial. So why, you know, what what said? Okay, let's go raise more money, right? Well, the size, you know, when you talk about hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Uh, you know, and you think you have a good shot at it, you know, go for it, right? Um, and at the, you know, one, we had a 75% chance of win. We were on three out of the four teams. This is the way it works in DOD. And the other one, we had a 33% probability, probability. We we're one of three. Um, and we knew that we needed to start hedging our bets a little and, and start looking at the commercial side of it. All right, here comes 2018, not too long ago. Notified, we lost both programs with Department of Defense. So bottom line is we could not, what I've learned the hard way <laughs> is disrupting the incumbent industrial base of the, the US military is really hard because, uh, and it was interesting, uh, there, you know, on one of the programs, there was three teams bidding. We were one. Uh, it was us versus two incumbents, right? One of the incumbents bid 160 million. We bid 200 million. The other incumbent bid 260 million. Okay, a hundred million dollar differential. We're right in the middle, uh, but closer to the uh, to the low bid. Um, and they were going to pick two to then have a runoff. Who did they pick? The two incumbents, right? And then I realized, oh wait, maybe there's still stuff I have to learn, right? There, there's more going on here. There's one politics, right? I, I noticed, uh, you know, uh, senators and congressmen showing up and you know having uh, and in certain engagements. So I, I knew that there was some influence, right? For uh, you know, um, because these companies are located in different parts of the country. Um, but then I also realized uh, if they had selected us, the pie is only so big. If we would have won that, we would have become one of the new incumbents and one of the other ones would have gone away. And they have stuff in the field and who's going to support that stuff in the field. So unless you are coming in with a solution that's going to be able to uh, you know, you know, take care of not only the current opportunity, but what has been already put out there, you're not going to win this, right? So it, it wasn't the simple math of, well, there's four teams and we're on three out of the four. So our probability win is 75%. Yeah, on paper, <laughs> but there's a lot more that's going on behind the scenes. So that was a really good lesson learned. Um, whoops. Um, now, here we are, 2018. Shoot, we just lost those those two programs. Uh, but there's more coming up, worth the hundreds of millions. Okay, where are we? We we generated over the past 12 years, we had generated 60 million of non-dilutive investment. You know, we had 60 million of non-dilutive investment and it generated this amazing IP. And we got 3.75 of dilutive investment from our VCs. So we still own most of the company. Um and we have great people and great technology. Um, we still have a pretty good defense R&D backlog. We have a bunch of contracts still, but still no viable traction in commercial. So what did we do? All right, time to focus on commercial, right? We could, you know, I, I, you know, I finally learned my lesson about these large defense programs. I said, I can't do it anymore. So, uh, we hired a business development person to look at commercial, right? To focus on commercial, finally. So remember, I reserved some of that cash in that second Series A, the Series A extension. 
we had that person uh, you know, looking at commercial. In fact, we prioritized all business development efforts on commercial over defense. Doesn't mean that we stopped defense. Um, and there's, you know, oh yeah, we'll respond to that proposal. But when I was looking about out years, we started thinking commercial. Um, the, the third thing we did in 2018, and I think it's probably perhaps the most important thing, um, is we created a strong vision. You know, we wanted to make the world a safer place for robotics. We, we wanted that we, we created a strong mission to improve worker safety and productivity. And we created core values, trust, respect, integrity, positivity. That was it. Those are our four, four values. Um, and we focused on it and we uh, daily, uh, we gave out core value awards. We made everyone live and breathe by that, that trust, that integrity, that respect, you know, the being a solution oriented mindset. And by doing that, like, even though we took a couple punches in the gut, you know, by these losses, we kept the team excited. We, we, we didn't lose hope. Um, so, uh, so why did we do this? Why did we say, all right, now is the time for commercial. We realized the binary nature of defense, um, you know, you either win it or you don't. It, it's literally, you're going to be making a thousand robots or you are making zero. Um, you know, uh, for these large programs. Yeah, we sold 650 along the way, but it was dribs and drabs right, to get there. Um, so, uh, you know, and with those, and like I said, we're not going to disrupt the incumbent industrial base. Um, then uh, we, we realized that our growth is going to come from commercial, right? If we're really going to, you know, make it, we, we need to focus on commercial markets. And we had enough backlog to support uh, a pivot, right? And this is so. This is what we're. This is the time of the pivot at 2018. Um, and then you know, once again, we realized that the strength of the company is its people. So this is this is why we made this decision. All right, final decision point, 2021. So here's where we are into 2021 nearing 15 million of revenue. Um, we had 50% commercial, 50% defense, right? Um, we had over 100 employees. We had strong traction in multiple markets now. Aviation, uh, you know, and, and it's been publicly announced. With the, in 2018, we started working with Chani Airport in Singapore on automating their airport, right? Uh, it, we, we, we still had our defense. Uh, we were working with a medical device provider. I still can't talk about that one. Uh, but I have, a, you know, we have publicly announced that we're doing uh, autonomous solar field construction. Um, we're working with uh, large EPCs, engineering procurement companies like Mortensen uh, and, and, and others. Um, we, we had shipped over 650 robotic arms, but the writing's now on the wall. Okay, we're we're on a trajectory. We we're, we're we're gaining that commercial traction, but really to scale, we need some capital, right? We're not going to get enough money out of our R and D contracts to do what we need to do. So you know, the question is, well, what do you do at this point? Well, I decided, okay, let's uh, let's uh, exit, right? So we did a merger through acquisitions. Um, we were acquired by Sarcos uh, Technology and Robotics Corporation for 100 million. Um, and now we're able to execute on our growth strategy because they have the wherewithal to allow us to scale and do what we needed to do. So why, why did we exit, right? Versus uh, go raise money or take another course. Um, well, first of all, we, we instantly gained access to the capital that we needed, right? Uh, to enable scaling a production company. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty in the market, right, in 2021. Um, and, and honestly, I'm not sure if an acquisition would have, if I would have waited till now, I'm not sure that acquisition would have happened, right? Uh, you know, market, everything's lots of timing in life, right? And if we would have gone and said, all right, well, we're not gonna do an acquisition, we're just gonna raise our own money to a series B, well, guess what? More money comes in, higher the expectations are for an exit, right? And an ROI for your investors. 
um, and would have been having us, you know, keep slogging it and slogging it. Whereas now we're just focused on, uh, you know, capitalizing um, and, and growing. So uh, that's where we, that's where we are. So now I'll, uh, you know, I, I was already squared for 20 years. So exactly 20 years in, uh, now we are Sarcos. Um, you know, that's the, the name going forward. Um, but the good news is same vision, just a larger portfolio, right? They, you know, coming out of Sarcos, they had exoskeletons. Um, they had anthropomorphic style uh, systems that were um, a derivative of the exoskeleton, like you can see in that bottom picture there, um, where we continue to bring what was our sapien line of robotic arms. Uh, it's now the Guardian XM up on the top left, as well as our underwater systems. Uh, we're bringing this all forward now as a unified company. And look at the, the mission still the same. We want to improve worker productivity and safety, right? So there was an alignment of vision and mission and complementary technologies and access to capital. That's why we said this is a great thing to do. Um, so maybe just, uh, you know, got five minutes left. You, know, you can't be at a robotic seminar without looking at some like pictures and stuff and videos, right? So here's one of the our uh, technologies where this was uh, autonomously refueling an Apache helicopter. That's a mock helicopter. For some reason, they wouldn't give us one in Lawrenceville. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we made a mock-up of the Apache. This was uh, at our time, the Sapien robotic arm. And you would have a robot in a Connex box in a remote location. And the Apache would land. You would say, hey, time for refuel. They never get out of the helicopter and get exposed, right? And the robot would drive out of the Connex box, drop, find visually using computer vision, find the helicopter, find a fuel port with a uh, fuel hose in tow, engage uh, and um, refuel it. So you can see here, um, and yeah, it's moving slowly because if you're near a, um, an expensive piece of equipment like a helicopter, you don't want to move fast or erratically. So um, it was able to, uh, you know, autonomously refuel the, the helicopter. Um, then uh, here's a couple other examples. Um, we're, we're looking at our XT. It was a Sapien 6M. It just got renamed to the Guardian XM. But you can see on the top left, or the top image uh, video. This is um, some of the technology out of Salt Lake. Um, this is the Guardian XT, where it's uh, using just hand tools like a human would use to do ship maintenance. This is a very early trial that we uh, just did with the Navy. Um, uh, and that one's usually a one-to-one, -one, where there's a, a human there using human tools, and it's a reflection of the person. Um, then you have uh, here the Guardian XM. This is demonstrating uh, autonomous, semi-autonomous, or what we like to call supervised autonomy. There's a person still there, but now you can start to get one to many, right? You can have one person overseeing three different robots that are starting to do uh, maintenance and repair operations on a ship. Uh, and this extends over to the, uh, you know, the, the air side. We have a program with the Air Force to do aircraft maintenance and in inspection as well. Um, uh, and then we, we publicly disclosed our, um, this is an early video. We'll, we'll be putting out some uh, newer video. This is an early testing of our autonomous solar field construction. So this is uh, our uh, Guardian XM arm picking up a solar panel. Uh, then you can see on the left, there's uh, a rail. That's the torque tube of a solar field that pivots and, you know, uh, with the sun. So this is just showing, and this is all computer vision based. There's no one uh, operating this. It's finding the panel, moving it to where it needs to go. And then this is a collaborative thing at this point where a human would still come in and do that final adjustment uh, and attachment. But this is important for two reasons. There's major lab labor shortages. You cannot get people to do this job. You're out in the desert uh, installing 50 pound panels. 
very injury prone, uh, number one. Number two, the industry's changing. They're going to higher density, more efficient solar panels that are going to be 100 pounds. It's now getting to the point where humans aren't going to be able to do this job. And the only way we're going to get the rate of installation of these solar fields is through robotics. So this is uh, one of our flagship uh, offerings that we're starting to push into the market. Um, there, there's several out there, but you know this is a good embodiment of you know that outdoor mobile robot doing a hard job um, and increasing productivity as well as keeping people safe. All right, lessons learned. You got look at that. We got 15 minutes of questions. All right, um, here's my first one. The unexpected path might be the right one, right? I didn't plan any of that. I'd love to say I'm this super genius and knew exactly, but nope, I'm just understanding and listening and, okay, well, this is one I planned, but let me just explore it a little bit and see where that takes me, right? Um, sometimes the obstacle is the opportunity, right? Um, the path is never the right, you know, a straight line. You know, life is always this, right? Um, and you have to know, you have to, it's a tough call to know when to pivot. Right? This, we did run this, explore this for a while, but, and and don't be so committed that, oh, well, we said we we're going to do that. So we got to stick doing that. Nope. Think about it and figure out, okay, well, maybe we should do this, right? Um, and, and it's okay to change your mind, right? And to, to redirect. Um, leverage every funding source you can. The, the government, you know, that non-dilutive funding, which was up over 75 million over those 20 years, was invaluable to creating uh, the value <laughs> that was acquired, right? Um, it, it gave us runway, it gave us stability. We didn't, we didn't have to worry about making payroll every month. We knew that we had enough backlog. Whenever I hired someone, I knew that I had six to 12 months of coverage for that person at all times, um, except for 2013. Uh, then, you know, tap into the networks. This town, Pittsburgh, is amazing, right? We got the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. We got Innovation Works, Catalyst Connection, ARM. You got, C you got all the universities, CMU, Pitt. It is the, and Pittsburgh is different than any other town. This is a community. I've never, even at RE Squared, we machine parts for Carnegie Robotics and for Carta and for Soul Power and for like we helped each other. This is like something unique about Pittsburgh. There's a it's a family feel. We have a strong work ethic where everyone uh we're, we're, and we're kind of probably too humble, right? The world doesn't know about us as much as they should. We're get we're it's getting out there more because we're we're just more about doing the job. We're just we're about achieving the task um, and, and it's a great thing. So embrace that, reach out, become part of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network to go to all the events and, and use those resources. We used, I got free interns from the Innovation Works. Um, we uh, got grants to help write SBIR programs through uh, Ben Franklin that I, by meeting someone at the University of Pittsburgh. Right, there's a great network with a lot of resources that can be leveraged. Um, diversify. Do not put all of the eggs in the defense basket, for example. Right, um, it's really important. If you want to survive, you have to have a diversified portfolio. I said this uh, once. I'll say it again. Vision, mission, core values um, are critical for building a strong culture. And a strong culture uh, is what is what makes it um, higher slowly. We, I would rather take um, a C player or a B player that is just in sync with the team and is driven and excited about what we're doing than put, uh, you know, five A A players that are on each other's last nerve and just are creating toxicity. That you need it. It's all about building a team. So it's excited to work together, right? And that 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 was one thing I learned. We would hire very slowly. In fact, we put more emphasis on the behavioral interview than we did on the technical, because working as a team was more, more important. 
Um, bring in marketing and business development calendar early. You, you know, uh, I was lucky that you know my wife joined me and brought in some new insights and perspectives that made me realize, oh yeah, it's not just technical. There's a lot more to to the business. Um, and here's I think the most important thing: success, no matter how you measure it, is a byproduct of taking care of people. Take care of people, and everything else just happens. Right? Success, technical success, uh, you know, growth, profitability. The second I realized that in 2018, just build a strong culture, take care of the people. Um, that's where it was just like buckle up and hold on, right? Um, so that I truly believe that that was that's perhaps my biggest lesson learned. I wish I would have applied. Not that we didn't really apply it, but. I really applied it and focused on it in 2018, and that's where things got. Um, that's it. Those are my, sorry. That's all the nuggets of, <laughs> I got for you. But thank you. Questions? Yeah. What were the best and worst decisions you have taken in the? As a CEO in the last 20 years. What was the best and worst decision that you have taken? Oh. Well, I walked you through a lot of my decisions. I don't know how many of them were good and how many of them were bad. But um, the I think the best decision was knowing when to pivot. Right? I think that was probably the best. Um, the worst was probably double put double down on going after those defense opportunities because I wasn't I didn't slow down enough to really understand the landscape. So that was probably my worst decision. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you for this amazing yeah. and insightful talk. Yeah. Um, I, I've been working on private sector robotic startup company before in the other part of the uh, world. You know, in most the country other than U.S., the the government and the military there isn't so rich. Yeah. So there there won't a lot of lucrative contracts from the defense sector. But yeah. The company I worked in uh, struggled several years in commercial area and it did a good job in commercial growth. Uh, anyhow, I would say if you go back at the beginning, if you want to start this all over again. Do you think you will still focus on defense work? Maybe at the beginning you focus on commercial instead of defense. Uh, what would you do it again? That's a great question. Would I do it again? Um, and, and this has come up. I've got, done some guest lectures before, and the question is like, can you even bootstrap a company anymore? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that like that's like really the the first question uh, before I could answer the the, the, the other question. I, I think the answer is yes. Right. Um, if you, as long if you're if you want to go into self-driving cars, I would not recommend bootstrapping right now. Right. If you have something that is you 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 have a little bit of vision and you think it's something the world's going to want, but it's probably five to ten years out, then you can bootstrap and start leveraging some of that government funding, et cetera, to to build up and get a, a jump start on everyone else. Um, you know, would I do it again? Um, not ex not exactly the way I did, it, right? Because I've because I learned along the way. Um, I might, you know, because the first five years it was just have it was a lifestyle company, right? Um, and you know, so it would be if I want a lifestyle company, I would do that, right? <laughs> if I want to grow a company and have an exit, I would, uh, you know. Well, I'm too tired now to do the bootstrap anymore. So if I were younger, I would do it again and bootstrap as long as I had a clear vision of where I, you know, I think the world's going to go. But if I'm older, like I am and tired, uh, what I would do is say, okay, where is there a clear opportunity with value proposition that I know I could own with this technology and I'd probably raise money to go execute on it, right? If I, but that's, so it all, so part of it's like, it depends on where you are in your, your you know, your career uh, and how much energy and gas you have in the tank, right? Because bootstrapping, it, it was a quick 20 years, right? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So on that same kind of topic, so, you know, this sort of non-dilutive 
diluted funding sort of trade off, right? Um, and speaking about bootstrapping, I guess uh, any insights into people that, you know, lots of people here probably would like to start a robotic company or they may have one that they're getting started. And if it's a hardware based company, it's very expensive to build hardware. Oh, it's hard yeah. for them to bootstrap. I assume it's hard for them. I don't know. Yeah. I assume it's hard for you to bootstrap that. Oh, yeah. And then there's this challenge of, okay, well, I can go to some VCs and get some money. But to your point, which I thought was really good, the more you do that and the more money you take in, the more the expectations are going to be high. That's right. Right. And it's expensive to build robots. So what yeah. what what should all of us collectively do? Yeah. Um, yeah. How well, do we address that? Is it non dilutive funding? Is there, is there, yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of it, right? Okay. You know, even if you are doing a VC route, mm -hmm. leverage every, you know, leverage every funding opportunity you can find, as long as it's not a distraction. Mm -hmm. But what we, you know, what we did, and this is is we own, we did, and I think why our our hit rate was so high on SBIRs and BAAs is we didn't go out, we didn't shotgun, we weren't an SBIR company. We we're like, does this one align with our product roadmap? Aha, this one will fit in like this, and this one will fit in like this, and this one we stitched together a bunch of non dilutive investment through the government that created a product, right? Um, then it, you know, but you can, you're not always guaranteed that the government's going to put out a solicitation that's exactly in your lane for what you're doing, you know, that things kind of 2013 the spigot went off, right? So that, but. We had, so maybe it was just, I don't know if it's luck, right? That we just got into enough people, enough IP, enough momentum that at that point we could raise money. But um, my recommendation is if you can leverage non-dilutive, do it, right? Um, uh, and, and if you have, if you're glutton for punishment, then bootstrap. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Which is quite long, but um, can you elaborate a little more on that? Because did you find so did they find you to use an investment bank? Oh, great question. Um, so uh, and let me wait, there's several questions there. And then uh, hey, how, negotiation. Oh boy, and all right. Value All right, thanks. So all right. probably commercially sensitive, but all right, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Marcel. Um uh so they I was starting to pulse the network. I did, you know, we, I engaged with an investment banker um, because along that journey, people had reached out to me and blah, blah, blah. so I'm like, okay, fine. Let's get a, I, I got an investment banker with, with Stifle and Nicholas and a great, uh, great investment banker who knew the robotics market. You know, he was involved in the universal robotics acquisition, et cetera. So that, you know, someone who knew the, the market um, and he was advising me um, and I put him under a retainer, but it, I, it wasn't like, okay, we're starting a process, right? It's just, let's have a start having a dialogue. And then all of a sudden Ben Wolf from, from Sarkos gave me a call. Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? And we started talking and, oh, well, well we're pretty aligned. And, uh, and then, uh, he ended up doing a SPAC, right? Um, and you know, raised 250 million and they went public, and then they had to execute on their plan. And uh, you know, hiring was really hard. You know, hiring robotics talent isn't the easiest thing, really good robotics talent. So uh, a good way to solve that problem is to acquire a company, right? And it just so happened that our companies were aligned. Um, and then uh uh, you know, we, we talked more and more and, you know, it, it turned into, hey, do you want to become part of this? And well, yeah. And and that, then your investment banker comes in and, <laughs> uh, and they, they write up term sheets and you start talking about numbers and roles and, you know, uh, everything involved. And uh, and it's exhausting. <laughs> uh, literally during acquisition, you know, careful what you wish for, because I would wake up at 8 a.m. I would go to bed at 2 a.m. and I would repeat. And I did that every day, including weekends, for months oh and months. And then, then you know, so, but, you know, that's what you do, right? Um, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad I did it. And I, you know, I wouldn't take it back, but, it, but it's a lot of work. Um, 
And then you have to, then you're in a situation where you have to integrate two companies. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Now I can take a break. No, I can't. Right. I, we got to get these. Now we got hundreds of people that need to come together. And, uh, and I was critical for that. So I didn't take a single vacation all of last year, but um, that's, but why I, I could, if I didn't care about people, yes, I would have. But the issue is I, once again, people first, I cared about uh, the people that were at RD Squared and I wanted to make sure that they were content and happy. And at the time of acquisition, all but one person joined uh, the, the new company. So uh, it, it shows that it was a, a, a good fit. Okay, well, any parting thoughts? We have time for one tiny question, or we'll just 